In this video, we will provide a tutorial on using the Smart Sensor app with our line of Smart Fixture Mount Sensors. We'll also show you how to access all of the features packed into this product line. The Smart Sensor app is designed for easy use. There are no dip switches or dials on the device, so any changes to the default setting must be done using the app. The app is called the Leviton Smart Sensor and is available to download from the Google Play or Apple App Store. First, if you plan to use the product in its default settings, the app isn't needed. The sensors are designed to work right out of the box in a popular configuration, auto on with a 20 minute timeout and daylight harvesting activated. If you'd like to make any changes to these settings, group with other fixture mount sensors or set up a schedule, then the app will be required. The Smart Sensor app is used with several products. To use with the fixture mount sensors, open the app and select the fixture mount sensor product line. The app will begin scanning for devices in your vicinity, usually within 100 feet. The sensors are broadcasting their Bluetooth signal out at all times, so there's no need to place the sensors into pairing mode. For helpful hints and tips, you'll see a question mark in the right-hand corner of every page in the app. This menu will give you some helpful information in case you have questions on what to do, next steps, or terminology. Sometimes when connecting for the first time, you'll be asked to OK Bluetooth access. The recommendation is to click on OK and while using the app. One of the helpful features with our Smart Sensor line and connecting via Bluetooth with the app is that additional features can be launched and uploaded to the sensors. These are not necessary for the functionality of the device and are only needed if the new feature is required for the application. If an update is available, click on More Details on the main Settings page. It will show if there are any updates available. If you'd like to download, click on the Updates Available button and then OK to confirm. The updates usually take two to three minutes depending on signal strength. Now that we've covered some basics, we'll get into the tutorial on product programming. First off, you'll need to open the app on your smartphone or tablet. Click on the Fixture Mount Sensor icon. You'll see a list of the smart sensor fixture mount sensors in the near vicinity appear on the top of the app. Generally, the sensors closest to you will appear on the list first or be close to the top of the list. Press the green Identify magnifying glass next to the sensor name. The sensor selected will blink with multicolored LEDs and the light that it's connected to will toggle on and off. If this is the sensor that you'd like to connect to, click on the name of the sensor or the carrot to the right. Depending on the size of the space and number of sensors, you may see a large number of sensors appear on the scan list. If you'd like to filter the results, you have a couple of options. First, you can filter by name. This is useful only if you already know the sensor name. This filter is typically used after you've connected and renamed a sensor. Another filter option is to adjust the RSSI strength. Default is negative 80 dBm. So anything less than 80 will reduce the strength and distance so that only the sensors closest to you will appear. Another option is to increase the RSSI strength. This is helpful if you're looking for sensors that may not have appeared on the original list and are further away. Once you have connected to a sensor, you'll be brought to the main settings page. Here, you can rename the device, which we highly recommend doing. This helps to keep track of which sensors have already been programmed and where they are located. Under More Details, you can review the sensor model number and firmware level and check for firmware updates. Below the range slide, you have the option to put the sensor in walk test mode. This is useful when testing the field of view to confirm proper coverage and whether the sensitivity needs to be increased or decreased. When in this mode, the timeout is shortened to 15 seconds. When finished, you can toggle the walk test to off or after 15 minutes, it will automatically shut off and resume normal operations. Next on this page, you may see a daylighting calibration note. We'll have more on daylighting coming up, but this is where the status is located if currently in calibration mode. For the operating mode, there are two options, auto on, also known as occupancy. In this mode, the lights or other loads will automatically turn on when the occupancy is detected and will stay on until the space becomes vacant and the timeout expires. The other option is photo cell only mode. In this mode, the occupancy detection is turned off and sensors will only make changes to lighting based on natural ambient light. Continuing with programming options on the main settings page, timeout is the amount of time that occurs when the lights will turn off after a space becomes vacant. 20 minutes is the default, but there are options from 30 seconds up to 60 minutes. This timeout is only for the primary timeout. If you are planning to program a partial off timeout, there will be another timeout setting option to select for that, which will be covered later. 
There is also walkthrough mode, not to be confused with walk test mode. Walkthrough mode should be enabled for spaces that tend to have very short periods of occupancy, such as aisleways or corridors, where people are just passing through. If enabled, the sensor will time out in roughly two minutes after vacancy versus the normal timeout setting. If the sensor sees extended occupancy, then the normal program timeout will apply. Scrolling down further on the main settings page, you'll see the section for advanced settings. Here is where you can configure settings for daylighting, dimming, trim levels, and where you can create templates that can be used to upload settings to other FMS sensors. This is where you can create schedules if using one of the models that has a real-time clock. First, we'll cover daylighting options. For daylighting, there are four modes to choose from. Disabled. This means the sensor will ignore any changes in ambient light. The next option is ambient light holdoff, which is generally used for switching only applications. If enabled and the target level is met, the sensors will hold the lights off regardless of occupancy detection. Next, daylight harvesting will raise or lower the light level based on the amount of natural ambient light entering the room or space to meet the target level. 0 to 10 volt dimming fixtures are required for daylight harvesting. The last option is daylight transition lighting. Think of it as reverse daylight harvesting, where the sensors and light levels match the ambient light. This is used in spaces where light transitions from dark to light or light to dark. It can be used in areas such as the first row of lights in a parking garage to help ease the transition for our eyes. Photocell mode. There are two options, opened and closed loop. Closed loop is the default and most common way to measure lighting below the sensors and based on both natural and artificial lighting. Open loop is used more for measuring natural lighting directly from a window or skylight. For daylight calibration, you can select the device to do it automatically or you can do it manually. For automatic calibration, the sensor will use Leviton's AutoCal process, which will hold the lights on for 24 hours to calculate the target value, which should be based on only artificial lighting. If manual calibration is selected, you can select the target value yourself. The page will display the current light lux value that the sensor is seeing. Once the target is set, the daylighting will kick in instantly, no need to wait 24 hours. For daylight harvesting applications, you can select a max dim 2 level. Even if a space is flooded with an extraordinary amount of natural ambient light, the luminaire lighting never dips below this value. When connected to a 0 to 10 volt dimming fixture, you can enable partial on and off levels and set minimum maximum trim levels under the dimming and load section. First, let's look at the dimming section. You can set partial on levels to where you want the lights to initially turn on. There is a slider bar used to set this level. If partial on is required, the sensor slash luminaire must be connected to an override dimmer. Partial off can also be set on this page if required. Once a space becomes vacant and the timeout expires, lighting will dim to this level rather than all the way off. There's a drop down bar to set the partial off timeout where lights will turn full off after this period. The timeout options range from 30 seconds to always on in case there's an application that requires lights to always be on at some level for safety reasons, such as parking garages or long corridors. To set trim levels, go to the load section which is the tab on top next to dimming. Under load, the dimming max level is used to reduce the maximum output of the fixture. This level becomes the new max bright output. The min setting is used to increase the lowest level before the fixtures turn fully off. Any adjustments to these values reset the low and high end trim lumen output of the fixture. Next under advanced settings are templates. You have the option to save settings as a template with the ability to reuse them in similar spaces. For example, if you are doing multiple aisleways in a warehouse that requires the same settings, you can save it as a template and then upload that template for the next sensor rather than going through each setting and making changes. After doing the first sensor, you can create a new template by clicking on the Create Template button and giving it a name. For the next sensor, you can go back to the same page and you'll see the template you just created. Just click on the template and press Save. The settings will be uploaded. Please note, the templates are saved on the phone or tablet and not via the app, so if you are using multiple devices, the template will only be saved on whichever device was used. Next, we'll show how multiple sensors can be grouped together to expand the occupancy sensing coverage. Up to 16 sensors can be grouped together. You can mix FMS models so that the models with the scheduling feature can be mixed with models that don't.
Internal mount versions can be grouped with external versions as long as they are a Leviton Smart Fixture mount sensor. The total distance of the group is limited by the Bluetooth signal range. To increase the range, it's recommended that you start with the sensor in the middle of the space or aisle to maximize the Bluetooth range in any direction. When grouped together, the sensors will share occupancy coverage, operating mode, timeouts, and schedules if applicable. Daylighting zones will be synced or remain independent. To create a group, start from the initial scan page. This is where you should identify and start with the sensor that will be in the middle of the group. Once you have confirmed the correct device to start the group with, click the check mark to start forming the group. At this point, you also have the option to rename the sensor. If no changes, click the Add button and the group is now started. At this point, it's just the initial device where the group was started from. Repeat that same process to add additional sensors or room controllers. The Identify button can be used to confirm you are adding the correct device. Up to 16 sensors can be grouped. Again, it's okay to have mixed groups or different smart FMS sensor models. Once a group has been formed, the devices in a group will appear with a light blue background on the scan page to show which devices are grouped together. Once a group has been formed, it's possible to access a group that's already been created and add additional devices at a later date. To add to the group, go to the main scan page and select the gear icon in the upper left corner of sensors showing in the group. If there are multiple groups and you aren't sure, you can use the identify icon. All of the devices in the group will identify themselves by flashing LEDs and toggling the light loads on and off. Once you've pressed the gear icon to the appropriate group, select the edit icon which looks like a pencil. A new scan list will show available devices. Just like previously when selecting items to the group, you can use the identify icon to confirm you are adding the right device. The next steps are the same as when you first started the group. Use the check icon to confirm the sensor. You will have the option to rename if you like and then add to the group. Repeat if more devices are to be added. If you ever need to remove a group or items from a group, this can be done from the main scan page. Find the group, use the identify icon if needed to confirm, and then select the trash can icon to break up the group. You'll be asked to confirm. If good, select delete. Next, we'll look at scheduling. You can create behaviors and have them run at set times during the day and week. The universal voltage models, ZLDUZ and OFDUZ, are the models with a built-in time clock. Schedules can be run on individual ZLDUZs or OFDUZs or in a group of FMS sensors that contain at least one of these models. With scheduling, you can have the sensors behave differently based on the time of day and or day of the week to maximize energy savings or change lighting behaviors based on how the space is being used. If the group is mixed, then when you are initially setting up the schedule through the app, you must be connected to one of the universal models, ZLDOZ or OFDUZ. Next, we'll walk through how to create a schedule for a group of sensors. The process for creating a schedule for an individual sensor is the same except from where the process starts. For a group, it's on the main scan page. Click on the gear icon and then the clock icon. For individual, click on the caret next to behaviors and schedules under the advanced settings section. After you press the gear icon, click on the clock icon. The first thing you'll need to do is set the time. The easiest way to do this is to import it directly from your phone. You may also choose to do this manually. In addition to the time, you will also want to sync the location settings. These will be geolocated with latitude and longitude settings. This is important if one of your schedules starts at sunrise or sunset, as that timing migrates slightly each day according to your geographic location and time zone. Next, select the Behaviors tab and click Create Behavior. A behavior is what you want to have happen when a schedule kicks in. First, you'll need to create a name for the behavior. This can be something like sunrise, day shift, night hours, etc. Next are the behavior attributes. The first attribute is the light level, which has several options. On. Select on for lights to turn fully on when the behavior starts. If a partial on level is also selected, the fixture will go to that level after the next vacancy, then occupancy. Next is off. Just like turning the lights on, they can be off when the behavior starts. This can also be selected if you would like the lights to remain completely off, like in a parking lot during daytime hours. Next is level. Similar to partial on when the behavior starts, the lights will automatically go to this level. This can be anywhere from 1 to 99%. Last is none. 
This means there is no specific lighting level that the lighting will go to when the behavior starts. In this case, it will only be based on other factors, such as the operating mode, which can be dictated by occupancy or daylighting levels. Next is the operating mode, which is just like the standard operating mode that is selected on the main settings page. However, this mode is specifically for the behavior. The operating mode options are Auto on. In this mode, the lights will automatically turn on with occupancy. The default is 100%, but the level can be adjusted with the partial on level. The lights will turn off upon vacancy and once the timeout expires. Manual on. To select manual on, the room controller must be connected to a low voltage keypad or companion switch or dimmer, which is required to be pressed to turn the lights on. The lights will turn off upon vacancy and once the timeout expires. Next is photo cell only. In this mode, the occupancy sensor is disabled and the lighting will only change based on changes to ambient light levels. The last operating mode is hold level. With the hold level, the lighting will be held at a specific brightness or level or completely off for the duration of the schedule running this behavior. Occupancy events and photo cell readings are ignored when in hold level mode. For lighting based on occupancy, you can also select partial off levels, including a timeout for the partial off level to go fully off. If you want the lighting to go to the partial off level and stay there, when the space is vacant, you can select that as an option in the app. For any of the behaviors other than when set to a particular level or if the photo cell is disabled, you can select Daylight Enabled, which will include daylighting with the behavior. For example, if the behavior calls for lights to turn on but there is sufficient ambient light available, it will dim down to the target level or keep the lights full off if the ambient light is sufficient. Once you have all the settings in place for the behavior, click on the Create Behavior button. You'll repeat this process for each new behavior you create. To run a schedule, you will need a minimum of two behaviors. Now that a behavior has been created, you need to click on the Schedules tab and tell when you would like the behavior to start. Once on the Schedules tab, click on Create Schedule. Select the start time for when you would like the behavior to start. This can either be a specific time or it can be based on sunrise or sunset times. You can even select to have it start at a specified period before or after sunrise or sunset. Next, you can select the transition time. This sets how long the behavior selected gradually transitions from the previous state. Transition times range from one second all the way up to three hours. You can also select which days you would like the schedule to run. It can be anywhere from one day of the week to mixed days or every day of the week. Below the day scheduled is a drop down to select which behavior will run. These are the behaviors that you would have created under the behaviors tab. Lastly, click on the create schedule button and the schedule is ready to go. Repeat the same process for each schedule that you'll need to run. For example, you may have one that will run weekdays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and then weekdays from 5 p.m. to 8 a.m., and then potentially another schedule that will start Friday at 5 p.m. and run until Monday at 8 a.m. Thank you for listening to our tutorial. This guide is intended to make your next job with Leviton Smart Fixture Mount Sensors go as smoothly as possible.